Cries of Kaulele, when Kutu shattered the stillness of the saucer like village nestling in the valley. Echoes bounced from hilltops, clashed mid air, ricocheted and fell in jumbled noises that boomed, invading our ears and jamming out all other sounds. We, Kau, Le, Tu, like a powerful magnet. The commotion pulled us away from the rag dolls that had so occupied us but a moment before. An old man, short, tight curled springs of wool on his head, making a grayish white skull cap, tottered past in what I saw was his earnest attempt at running. Held high in the hand, a knob curry jutted out and away from his body. Each time he shouted, Mbambeni, catch her. He stretched out the arm, holding the knob curry, pointing the stick towards the mountain. My eyes leapt to where he pointed. The mountain was playing a game of hide and seek with the sun. Or was it with the clouds? Anyway, half the mountain had disappeared. I threw my eyes towards the remaining half. There, distant, shrunk figures scurried, hurried, ran, and scrambled. Ahead, a lone figure darted like a hare with a pack of dogs hard on its tail. The clouds were no idle players, I saw. They were the third party to this game, and they would make the telling difference. Clearly, that day, I witnessed the birth of tears. The clouds wept and showered soft tears of mist onto the silent mountain. There she was. Clearly, I saw her. Surely, her pursuers too could see her. See her as I did. My insides churned. A hot ball of fear curled inside my stomach. But the clouds, not to be outdone, wept. Thick, fat, dark gray spears fell. Fast and hard they came, thick, fat, safe for her to be enveloped in and lost to her pursuers. Uye P, Uye P, where's she gone? Sounds of distress from those who are bent on her capture reached me. I held my breath as I strained with her, willing her to elude them, urging her on and on and on. There she was flitting here and there between boulders, her long new wife-length dress making her seem without feet. As she hurried escaping, she appeared to me to be riding the air, no part of her body making contact with the ground. Away she floated, the men plodded behind her. I saw her waft into the wall of mist, I saw it close the crack she'd almost made gliding into it, like a fish slicing into water, she'd but disturbed it, and it rearranged itself accepting her into itself and away from those who harried her. I cannot remember her face at all. It was a long time ago and perhaps she had not tarried long with us. I don't know. But I remember her leaving and that is because it taught me about determination, the power of one's will. It must have been midday, for the sun was well up and we children were already outside at play. That is, those of us too little to go to the one mud-walled, grass-thatched house called school. I know I should have been sad at losing an aunt. I know she was a good Makoti, cooked and cleaned well, and we children were saved from a lot of chores by her coming. New wives are worked like donkeys, as initiation into their new status. I know I should have sympathized with my uncle, who lost not only a wife, but also the cattle, the lobola he had given for her. All I know is the thrill I felt watching her escape into the thick gray cloud and mist.